When John Behrman called and invited me up here, this is indeed the first time that I've appeared uh, in public without the shield of the newsprint around me uh, since I agreed to the uh, ridiculous job of writing about computers in a daily newspaper. Uh, and John Berman called and he said, we'd like you to um, introduce the people who are going to be doing the demonstrations for Windows NT and OS 2, and he likened it to a World Wrestling Federation match. <clears throat> so the people down in front, you may be splattered with blood by the end of this, but, but it should be very interesting. This, this is indeed, as, as John said, you're, this is history here. Um, when the next century dawns, you may not actually have Windows NT or OS 2 specifically on your machine, but it's going to be something like it because 32-bit operating system, I know they want it exactly to be Windows NT and OS 2. But, but it, it's going to be, it's going to be 32 or 64 or 120, I mean, it's only going to get bigger. Uh, it's only going to get uh, more powerful and, and it's only going to get friendlier. Um, the interesting thing is what has happened here has changed these companies. At Comdex, you had Bill Gates in a suit and you had Jim Canavino in a red sports shirt. And I noticed tonight the Microsoft guys are in suits and ties and the guy who's going to demonstrate OS2 is in a red sports shirt. <laughs> Anytime you can get IBM out of those white shirts. <laughs> At any rate, this is, this is an important night and this is a glimpse into the future. Um, and watch very carefully because I know some of you people here are going to be making decisions as to what kind of, uh, as to which way you're going to go. And you're going to launch your company off on a direction that's, uh, uh, that is toward the 21st century. Uh, the first person tonight who won the corn toss and who will be going to the mat first uh, is uh, Doug Davis of Microsoft. He'll be demonstrating Windows NT. Uh, and we have with IBM Dave Barnes looking natty and maroon uh, over here. And uh, sit back, uh, relax, and enjoy it, as Clayton Williams said. And, uh, and I'm sure... And I'm sure that this is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, at least I, I don't have a, a blue suit on. Uh, that's, that's one thing good about it. Uh, my name is Doug Davis. I've been with Microsoft for the last three years now. Uh, I used to sell OS2. Uh, now I sell Windows and Windows NT. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, start off the presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on with Windows T NT, where it is today. Uh, hopefully we'll get down in some of the architectural aspects of Windows NT. You'll see why we feel it's a superior product to other uh, operating systems on the market. Uh, and last, we'll get into a demo. Uh, I, I can't see many hands, but I can see a lot of them. How many people are out there running Windows 3.1 or Windows Today? A lot of people. Okay, how many people got their Bill Gates wedding invitation? Don't, don't pull their audience. Okay, I won't. But I've broken a rule already, I'm sorry. Uh, last uh, Monday, the 24th, uh, Bill Gates announced uh, Windows NT at Comdex. Uh, it was a very low key announcement. Uh, it was simulcast to about 50 cities. Uh, for Microsoft, anyway, that's a pretty big event. And uh, the, the presentation he did was very low-key. It wasn't a lot of glitz, uh, wasn't any dancers, any songs or song or anything like that. But uh, he the, the pre purpose of the presentation was to show the power of NT and show that the, the market has been needing something uh, like that. I know uh, you've probably seen this article in, the, in some of the trade rags recently. Uh, <laughs> NT, uh, fortunately, has generated a lot of interest, uh, even though it was an unannounced product. Uh, so a lot of our competitors had, uh, had started positioning against NT uh, before the release, and this article has been running for quite a while. Uh, they're not their only competitor, though, that's uh, 
got NT in mind. Uh, Sun is also, with their Sun Select product, uh, focuses on NT. Uh, a lot of people are giving Microsoft credit for bringing the rest of the industry together uh, to create some standards. Uh, I don't know whether that's out of fear, survival, I, I'm not sure. One person or one company just can't deliver an operating system and make it successful. Uh, it has to be a combination of a lot of things. Uh, you have to depend on software developers. Uh, you have to have solution providers or people who deliver solutions in large corporate customers. Uh, of course, you have to have a company there that has the vision to do it. And you also have to have hardware vendors. And they all have to work together. And we kind of feel that Windows NT makes all the puzzles fit together, puzzle pieces fit together. From a Microsoft's perspective, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, in things in the press about where NT is positioned. But from just a marketing standpoint and where we feel it's going, essentially we feel it's the most powerful client server, desktop or server on the market today. On the market, that's an house product. <laughs> We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, it's, it's only one piece of a family, though. I mean, there were a lot of people that are running Windows 3.1 today. Uh, a lot of people still use DOS. But, but essentially, Windows NT it fills out a family of operating systems. Uh, we start off with the low end. Uh, you can run Windows today on pen systems, uh, laptop systems. As we move up the, the chain of hardware, you see we go to Intel-based workstations. Uh, that evolves to risk-based workstations and eventually uh, symmetric multiprocessing super servers. And the intention from Microsoft is to have an operating system that runs on all of those environments so that from a user perspective, from a development perspective, you have a common interface, you have a common API set, and you have all the, all the common things that make it easy to develop and deliver on any of those platforms. Now, let's talk about the Windows NT to architecture. It's, uh, it was designed by David Cutler, essentially. Uh, David Cutler was the father or chief architect for VMS for DEC. And when he came to Microsoft in 1988, his mission was to build the most powerful PC operating system. Now, that was OS2 when he came. Uh, and a lot of people forget that when, when we first went into this project, the whole operating system as it existed today was OS2 3.0. And I can pull back slides from way back then and see that the same feature set that's in Windows NT today was an OS2 3.0 feature set. But essentially, it's, it's a modular and layered architecture. I'll, we'll go into a little more detail on that. It's client server in its implementation. And you'll see how that applies in a second, too. It's portable. Uh, very important as we move through uh, enterprise architectures and and get into new advances in chip technologies that you're able to port your operating system easily, easy as hardware vendors come up with new technologies. Uh, when, in, when, when Windows NT will be released, it will run on the Intel 40, 386, 486 Pentium architectures. It will also run on uh, the MIPS R4000 family of processors and the DEC Alpha family of processors. So NT will be an operating system that spans multiple processors. And it also was designed from, from the ground up to be symmetric multiprocessing. And essentially what that is for the user is the ability to throw in a new processor into their machine and get linear performance increases. So that if I determine that I'm CPU bound, if my machine supports it, I put another processor in that machine, and lo and behold, my machine gets faster. Now this is really important when I'm talking about large computing and enterprise environments where I need scalability to where I can deliver a solution, and then as I outgrow that solution, I don't necessarily, my, my system is not outgrown. I add processors and memory to it. Now, as a base component of the NT architecture are protected subsystems. Now, there's two different types of protected subsystems in NT. One of those is environmental subsystems. And that's where we have the Windows 32 programming environment. We have the DOS programming environment. It's where you can run DOS applications. You can also run Windows 16-bit applications. You can run POSIX 1-based applications. You can also run character-based app, OS2 character-based applications, and those are the OS2 16-bit applications. Now, the purpose of the OS2 subsystem is essentially to give users the ability to our time so that 
they can take their OS2 server-based applications and move those to NT over time. Uh, what we found in, in a lot of OS2 development was server-based, and there were a lot of client-server applications developed under OS2. So we needed a subsystem that would allow the users to move and migrate to a high-end operating system. And the last one is uh, integral security. Uh, security is very important to the base product, and it's essentially not something that was bolted in or architected in. It was architected from the ground up to be C2 secure, and what that is is a government specification that sets a security level. Now here's a, a graphical view of the NT architecture, and let me just take it from across the top. You have your OS2 16-bit applications, you have your POSIX, bit applica POSIX applications, the Windows 32, MS-DOS, and Windows 16, and these all run in what's referred to as user mode. Uh, there are two modes that NT use. I know a lot of people have ever heard of six, uh, Ring 0 versus Ring 3. Uh, for example, that architecture doesn't exist in risk-based processors. Uh, everything is divided into two pieces, either user mode or, or the kernel or privilege mode. Well, all the subsystems and applications run in what's referred to as the user mode. And as we move down the kernel side of things, we can see that the hardware is at the very bottom. We have this little piece of code here called HAL. Uh, it's it, it, good choice. Uh, I know it really wasn't uh, meant to be that, but uh, it's referred to as the hardware extraction layer. And what that does is it isolates NT from any hardware-specific components. Uh, for example, there's no standard today in the PC industry on delivering multi-processing machines. Uh, if you talk to AST, Compaq, Dell, uh, WISE, all these people that are delivering multi-processing systems, they're not designing them exactly the same. It's not the golden age of PC compatibility that we once realized. So we needed a, an, a software isolation layer that we could uh, isolate those machines from the operating system and run NT on those very seamlessly. And that's where the hardware abstraction layer came from. Uh, the kernel, the big piece down here, uh, the kernel in NT is only 40K, uh, believe it or not. The, the use of memory in NT is mainly to run the protected mode subsystems and some of the other caching mechanisms. But the kernel is very small, referred to as a microkernel. Uh, you have different subsystems on top, or s different object layers on top of that. I'm not going to go into detail on each one of them, but uh, we have caches and, and a process manager, and essentially the I.O. systems and the network device drivers. Uh, about the, the system itself contains about 4 million lines of code. Uh, the kernel itself, I said, is 40K. 95% uh, of it is written in C, and only 5% of it is written in assembler. That makes it extremely easy to port to different architectures. Now, we, we talked about symmetric multiprocessing and what that means. Well, I'm going to look at, this is a sample application. Uh, you could have pulled this out of any Unix uh, vendors, uh, symmetric multiprocessing. That's really where you, uh, symmetric multiprocessing started. But you have a process that is essentially bound to each CPU in the machine. And, that's, and that can be very high performance, but it, it, there are some problems with it. Uh, first of all, uh, everybody communicates through the shared memory, which is not the most efficient way to do it. Uh, the application essentially has to play operating system. It has to understand when things are, are coming in a, into focus, coming out of focus. And there's a lot of overhead that people have to build into their applications to make them multiprocessing aware. Well, with Windows NT, we can take a different approach. And let's just talk about one of the products from Microsoft, and that's SQL Server for NT. Uh, in that thing we have, in, in that pro program, we only have essentially one process, and we break them into multiple threads or, or smaller processes. And we let the operating system handle the scheduling of those processes across uh, the different CPUs. Uh, that's a lot more efficient. We let the operating system handle it. Uh, there's not a lot of complexity that we have to build into our code. It's essentially all handled by the operating system. Now, we feel that NT is a powerful uh, platform for building solutions. Now, there's a, it's a reliable architecture. Uh, a poorly behaved application cannot crash the system. Uh, we talked about how the, the application and their subsystems run in the user mode. Uh, at no time does an application in Windows NT link into any system memory, uh, something that other operating systems uh, 
uh, will let you do. Uh, that can't happen in Windows NT, so an application cannot crash the system. Uh, we have desynchronized input queues. Uh, this is very important. It sounds very technical, but what, what essentially it means is that uh, I'm not limited by what, whatever task I'm doing to go do another operation. Uh, right now in OS2 and Windows, if I clicked on the file manager to do a drive search, I wait to do a drive search because essentially the system is processing input. Uh, Windows and OS2 today share what's referred to as a single message queue. And what that means is that all the messages that are passed through the system pass through one place. In NT, every application ha has their own unique queue, so that cannot happen. Uh, we talked about security a little bit. It's integrated into the system. It was architected in. Uh, we have UPS support that's built into the product. And last, we, have, we support asynchronous I.O., which is a really high-speed way of writing code. The file system in NT is new. Uh, we had to develop a new sys file system for one reason, uh, that being that to be secure and to be a government-level security, uh, the file systems that are out there today don't support the kind of access control structures that you need for a high-end operating system. Uh, we'll support very large disk and files. Uh, I think they've calculated that NT will support volumes up to 184 terabytes. Now, that's volume size, and you can have multiple volumes in the system. So I don't think we're going to be running out of file size limitations for a long time. Uh, we have long file names, and we also auto-generate 8.3 names, which is very, uh, very useful if you have users that are accessing NT as a server. Uh, if they're on a DOS machine, they see their old 8.3 name, you can still use a long file name, and the file names are, are linked together. Uh, we have Unicode support, which is very important for international market. Uh, we do transaction logging for quick recovery. Uh, what this does is if the file system ever goes down, you have to reboot. Uh, today, you, you essentially wait on check disk to check your file system to see if it's okay. Well, imagine running check disk on 184 terabyte volume size. Uh, we would be here uh, for a very, very long time waiting on that to complete. So with transaction recording of, of the, the processes that take place in the file system, we can recover very large volumes in seconds instead of hours. And last, the file system itself is built for 64-bit access. Uh, all file offsets are 64-bit. So that's why we get such a large size out of the file system. Now, it preserves your existing investment in MS-DOS applications. You can run your MS-DOS applications as they exist today. You can run multiple MS-DOS applications. We'll show you that during the demo. Uh, anything that's MS-DOS 5 compatible will operate in this environment. Uh, you can do full screen or window text. It's up to you, just like in Windows. And you can also copy and paste to the clipboard. Very seamless. You can preserve your investment in Windows applications by running your existing 16-bit applications. Essentially, you can copy, paste, DDE, OLE between 16-bit and 32-bit applications. Uh, the Windows 3.1 apps run as they're designed to, and that's to, to run in, uh, in the same memory address. Windows NT applications are 32-bit applications run in their, a separate memory address. Windows 16-bit applications run in a single address space. Uh, performance is compar compatible or comparable to Windows 3.1. Uh, user will not notice the difference between running a Windows application under NT or running it under Windows 3.1. And last, uh, it's binary compatible. You can run your Windows 16-bit applications on either the Intel platforms or any of the RISC-based platforms. Yes. Yes, enhanced mode. 32-bit uh, applications for Windows NT and Windows 3.1. Uh, as part of the developers conference last July, we released a specification known as Windows 32S, which is a subset, a subset of the Windows 32-bit API set. Uh, today, you can, under Windows NT, you can run a Windows 32-bit S application under Windows NT as a native 32-bit application or run it as a 16-bit or 32-bit application under Windows 16. Uh, and the way this is accomplished is through running uh, virtual device drivers on top of Windows 3.1. That's something that OS2 cannot do today. 
Uh, Windows NT has built in, 3.1 has built in networking. Uh, essentially, in a base NT box, you have an unlimited file and print server. Uh, let us support an unlimited number of user connections, however many you feel that you will let on your machine in a networked environment. Uh, it's protocol independent. Uh, you can run IPX, TCP IP, NetBuoy, OSI, any protocol you select. Uh, the three protocols in the product uh, will be a NetBuoy or a NetBIOS based protocol, TCP IP, and DLC are the data link control protocol used to do 3270 access. Uh, it's a superset of what work group for Windows. Uh, I know a lot of you were here probably in February, I guess it was, when we did the uh, demo of Windows for work group. Uh, it has the same features, NetDDE, chat, uh, all that's built into it, file and printer, easy file and printer sharing for the user. And the mail and schedule plus are as applications is all, are also built into the system. Uh, we have an OSF DCE compatible RPC. Now that's a lot of letters. Let me tell you what that means. Uh, OSF is a uh, is a is a stand is a is a body working on delivering of an operating system. They have a remote procedure call mechanism which allows two machines to talk to each other. And it's referred to as a remote procedure call. Uh, all of the remote procedure calls in NT are DCE compliant. Uh, what that really means is that from uh, another DCE environment, whatever that might be, to an NT environment, we can share information or connect to databases or write distributed applications. It's network independent and it's protocol independent and really simplifies your development. Now, as far as connectivity to Unix environments, uh, we, do, we support POSIX.1, which is a programming, uh, it's a government programming standard. Uh, we do X Windows emulation. Uh, this was demonstrated at Windows World uh, last month. Uh, we also support Windows sockets and RPC mechanisms. As far as network integration, I, I stated already that TCP IP is included in the box. We have an SVR4 compatible streams environment. And NFS, our network file system, as it's referred to, is also available from NT from a third party. Now, Windows NT was built more for just end users. It was built for manageability, uh, very important in large computing environments. Uh, we'll support both NetView and SNMP, which are uh, mainframe or Unix-based consoles to do network management right out of the box. We'll, uh, we have utilities in NT that are already meant for remote management. Uh, for example, as a remote administrator, I can change the configuration of an NT machine. Uh, I can limit a user's uh, options on an NT machine to where they can't can change this configuration. I can monitor its performance. I can do remote backups. Everything that I would think of doing at the desktop as a uh, land administrator or network operator, I can do remotely now using Windows NT. I, I already said we support NetView and SNMP as far as NetView reporting. You can map any NT-generated event, which is anything that happens in the system, can generate a NetView alert so that uh, from a host-based system, you can uh, submit commands to NT systems or take alerts to NT systems. As far as SNMP, we'll support the standard uh, architectures for uh, MIB1 and MIB2, and uh, it's all extensible. Now, there's a separate product from the base product for NT, and it's referred to as NT Advanced Services. Uh, we have centralized administration so that you have one user account and log on throughout your enterprise. We have a remote access server that's included in the product. Uh, this gives you the ability to dial up asynchronously and connect to an NT machine as if you were connected to the network. Uh, we support Macintoshes as clients for this environment. And we've also added enhanced fault tolerance in this product. Uh, we'll support file replication, disk mirroring, disk duplexing, and RAID 5 in software. So there's no need to buy specialized hardware to do things like disk striping and disk striping with parity. Uh, that can all be done in software now in NT. As far as pricing goes on NT, uh, the NT full package product is $495. Uh, upgrade from DOS or Windows or OS2 is $295. Uh, the advanced server product, now there's some things to consider here like uh, having the, uh, an unlimited file and print server. 
uh, roll Windows and Novell into one box and essentially try to figure out what that would cost. Uh, Windows NT Advanced Server product is, is $29.95 and an introductory price right now is $14.95 and of course the upgrade from the land manager is uh, $5.95. Now, I, I put this little chart together. When, when it, initially they asked me uh, uh, to do this presentation, I said, great, I get to go show uh, Windows NT to How PC and they said, well, uh, IBM's going to be there with OS2 and I'm going like, why? <laughs> why? Well, I, I didn't understand that question. You know, I didn't understand. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot, oh, I forgot to bring it up to me. Anybody see the Borg? The Borg is here, cover on the IBM magazine. Who's the Borg in this instance? I, I couldn't figure that out for some reason. Uh, anyway, I kind of break this down a little bit, have a little fun here. Uh, between Windows NT and OS2 2.1. Now, Microsoft feels it to be a very advanced desktop operating system. There are certain requirements that you have to fill. Uh, of course, IBM and OS2 and Windows NT satisfy the majority of these, those being uh, run DOS applications, run Windows 16-bit applications, run 32-bit GUI applications. Uh, you can also run POSIX applications in Windows NT. You cannot do that today in OS2. Uh, as far as preemptive multitasking, yes. Uh, Multi-threading for 32-bit applications, yes. Uh, separate address space for applications, yes. Uh, separate message queues for applications. Uh, that's what I talked about earlier about desync, uh, uh, desynchronous, uh, asynchronous act, uh, input queues. We do it, they don't. Uh, we're portable to risk. That they're not running on risk right now. They may demo it up here. I, I hope I'd like to see it. Uh, you have. Symmetric multiprocessing support, uh, C2 level security, uh, built in file and printer sharing, yes, there, no. Uh, built in email and scheduling, yes, no. Uh, built in remote administration tools, yes, no. Uh, they do do good SNA support, uh, so do we. And uh, TCP IP is, is a protocol included, yes and no again. Now, Let's talk about some of the other things going on with Windows NT. Uh, Microsoft just announced that we're in the middle of a research project with several leading computer universities and giving them the Windows NT source code. Uh, those being Brown, uh, Carnegie, MIT, uh, California Berkeley, uh, University of Washington, uh, some of the standard research institutes. Uh, the purpose here is to open up NT to these environments and let people add value to it without necessarily creating new operating systems. Uh, something that happened to Unix that hope that we can avoid. Now, where do we go from here? Well, uh, for those of you running Windows that don't uh, upgrade to Windows NT, I doubt there'll be there'll probably be a few of you out there. But anyway. Uh, there'll be a version of Windows in the future and it's referred to as Chicago. Uh, in the press anyway, that's the code name internally in Microsoft. And of course, Windows NT users will move to a product referred to as Cairo. And I want to concentrate on that product for a second. Uh, now, what do we get to in this environment? Well, we're, we're, we're a long way from there right now. We're, we're probably two years from seeing this product in the market. Uh, we'll probably go into beta sometime late this year. Uh, but essentially the things that we add are, are things, are services on top of a good foundation. Uh, we have a good multi, multi uh, uh, sorry, uh, microkernel architecture already in place. We have the symmetric multiprocessing and security all already in place. So what do we add on to that? Well, we add things like an object-oriented file system to where uh, file names essentially become irrelevant in this environment. Uh, you store data and you retrieve data. You do context instances and rich indexing so that I can search for all documents on my hard drive that had the, the uh, word you in it or, 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 or at or the, whatever. Uh, it's, it's all indexed and context indexed. We also add things like remote activation and replication. Uh, these are really get into a, a high-end uh, object-oriented type of system. Uh, we had distributed management and security, uh, this being based on a lot of the work done by MIT uh, having to do with Kerberos. And last, we're based on OLE 2.0 and Windows 32. Well, that pretty much uh, wraps up my part of the presentation. Now we're going to get to a little bit of the demo.
just to give you an example of what I'm running here, I have a compact uh, 486C. It's a 6646 processor. Uh, the first thing you'll notice that Windows prompts me for a logon. Uh, every user in the system has to have an account. Can you not hear me? No. ABP. Well, anyway, the first thing you'll notice is that the user has to log on. Uh, whenever I'm gone away from the system, it will ask me to reinitiate the logon sequence, which is ultra control delete. Uh, every time you go to a system, you'll see the all control delete piece to it. And I have to enter a password, and Joe left me the password is G. I think it is. <laughs> Try it again. Oh, okay. Third try is a charm. It's that case sensitive uh, password line in there. Uh, first thing I kind of open up, the first thing you'll notice is uh, the cursor. Uh, if you look real close at the cursor, uh, we, we've added something to NT, it's referred to as animated cursors. And what I'd like to do is change it to my favorite animated cursor. We'll do a browse. Oops. And we have the horse as the cursor. I, the, the other big thing that's glaring in NT is it, it looks just like Windows 3.1. Uh, I did a demo. Uh, I did the demo at the convention center last February. It's, it, to me, it's very hard to demo NT uh, because, I mean, a majority of the people out there are running Windows today, and I can tell you that it has a GUI interface and it has drag and drop and uh, lets you set up program groups, but you know all that. Uh, it's just Windows 3.1. Uh, some of the things that are unique about NT uh, talk about, for example, are the file system. Uh, the file system uh, will support long file names. As you can notice in the, uh, the bottom dialog here, I have long directory names and long file names. Uh, I can do things in NT that in the background that I probably couldn't have done before. Uh, excuse me, for example, I'll do a, a, a search of, of a directory. I'll do, whoops. The horse kind of gets away from you sometimes. You kind of have to watch it. Okay, we'll do a search. And we'll search all files and all directories. Uh, and that's going on. And of course, I can now switch back and do something else if I want to. Uh, just to give you an idea, now I can open up the current command pop, run a command, works fine. I can go back to my search. Uh, boom, I'm now searching on all directories. So that was only really meant to demonstrate some of the multi-processing aspects of, of NT and the fact that you can switch away from task. Uh, you're no longer I.O. bound by anything that you do in the system. Uh, some of the other things in this file system, are, for example, on the NTFS volume, which is the, the E volume, uh, there's a new uh, button across the top on the toolbar. It's where the horse is galloping right now. And uh, that be, being a key or security aspect. Uh, this gives you the ability, no director. Okay, let me select a file here. Click on the key. And now I can set security privileges down to the file level. Uh, I can change that to where I can get access for full control. Uh, I can give people some special accesses that I've set up, which may be some multiple of these, change access, or uh, just read access if I needed to. Another thing you'll notice about uh, Windows NT, as far as the, uh, the interface, uh, interface goes, the DOS boxes, we talked about that already. Uh, let me shrink this down, get that horse, whip him in shape. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole list of performance uh, monitoring tools here uh, to where I can monitor the CPU performance. I'm doing that already in one of those. Uh, right now, I'm measuring the, the processor utilization on this machine. Uh, NT is very, when I talked about remote admin tools, uh, for example, you can see the dialog that has slash slash Joe TU underscore 46. Well, that's extensible. If I was on a network, I can monitor someone else's machine. 
or monitor my boss's machine if I want to see if he really gets any work done or not. Uh, we'll do done. Uh, the print manager is same in, uh, same as in Windows Workgroup. Uh, some of the unique things about Windows NT printing, uh, you do not have to have local printer drivers loaded locally. Uh, for example, the only person on your network that has to have the printer driver is the machine that's connected to that network printer, whether it be over the network Whatever machine is spooling the jobs, essentially, that's the only machine that has to have the printer device driver. Now, this is very, very nice. Uh, we, we, do, we use remote procedure calls and sending metafiles to the server machines so that if you ever update the printer driver, you only have to update it in one place. Uh, people can connect to printers using long file names and not have to worry about uh, what my printer driver is. Uh, I can throw a new printer in there, throw a new memory in it, throw a new type of cartridge in it, and the system can automatically take advantage of that by just upgrading the printer driver in one place. Uh, the DOS command prompt is, is about the same. Uh, there's built-in sound support in Windows NT if we were to go back to uh, control panel. Uh, here's where I changed the cursors. Uh, if you'll notice from the just control panel aspects, all configuration options are changed through control panel. Uh, there's no such thing as a... Uh, config sys or an auto exec in NT. Everything is stored in a binary database. Uh, if you ever mess your configuration up, which I know that some people do, and uh, I always had to carry around a DOS boot disk in case I mucked with my system. Well, NT will remember your last known good configuration and will boot to that configuration. So that if I go in and muck with the, uh, the machine's configuration, I blow it away, uh, it won't boot. It'll come up and says, say that uh, I've detected a bad configuration. I'm going back to your last known good one and loading that one, which is very convenient and manageable. Uh, the sound works great. Uh, I, I mean, it, I'm not going to blow you away on the sound here. The, the whole thing is that for those people that are familiar with Windows 3.1, uh, you'll be very familiar with Windows NT. Uh, you'll be able to take advantage of the power of the system from day one. Uh, there's no learning curve on user interface. Uh, everything that you want to do is right there in front of you. It's just an extension of the Windows family. And with that, I'd like to really thank you for your time. Hopefully. Okay. Okay. Test one, two, three, four. Test one, two. I think I'm ready here. Let's see which microphone I'm working off. This one here. And I need to switch a button, and we're on. Let's see. I need to go to. Yeah, yeah. I'll say, yeah, yeah. Now, and yes, that's my password. Now, I have to, uh, my name is David Barnes. Let me start out by saying, I like wearing these kind of clothes, okay? <laughs> I also have to say, more than once in the last few weeks, I've had people say that Microsoft is getting to be more like IBM used to be, and IBM is getting to be more like Microsoft used to be. I like that, too. Now, a couple other things. Before I even start, first of all, I have no bullets. This is pure demonstration. It's all code that you can buy today. It's shrink wrap, okay? Every application I'm going to show you, you can buy today. Before I get into that, though, I've got to really say one big thing. A couple of years ago, the very first PC users group I ever presented to was y'all. I can say that because I'm in Texas, right? Since that time, I have made it a habit. That's pretty much what I do. I will tell you the only reason that OS2 2.1 is alive today is because of users groups, Team OS2, and grassroots people. It is certainly not because of IBM's incredible marketing skills, okay? <laughs> yeah. 
the users wouldn't let the product die, and that's what it comes down to. And I'll tell you that I am like you. I am a user. I'm not an architect. I spent a few years in the field with an oscilloscope. I finished, son of, spent a few years as an SE, as a PSR. I used to spend, I, we, some people say in the trenches, they haven't been there. It's in the cubicles, okay? I've been in the cubicles, in the ranks. And that's where I want to approach the use of this product from. Now, OS2 2.1 that I'm going to show you right now, this is the real shrink wrap level code, and that is the workplace shell in front of OS2. Now, if you say the workplace shell, didn't IBM used to have the presentation manager? This is the presentation manager. Nothing has changed as far as that. If you write programs to OS2, you still write using the PM APIs. None of that's changed. The workplace shell is the way I interact with it. It is an object-oriented user interface. Object-oriented in a couple of things. One, everything on the screen is an object. All objects are acted upon the same way. For example, if I click with the left mouse button, I select an object. If I click with the right mouse button, I get a pop-up menu. That is true for every object without exception. Um, down here is my printer. Let right mouse button, pop-up menu. Even my desktop is an object. It has a pop-up menu. You can create your own menu items for those things you want to get to quickly. And it's very quick and easy to create those menu items. As I go along in the workplace, I'll look for that. You'll see the pop-up menus all of the time. One of the things that's always there is help. The online help is good in OS 2. 2.1 is significantly better than 2.0 as far as its online help. It is really good. Uh, as I go along also, I really have to point this out. This is important. The workplace shell is a job. In OS 2, we call them a process. It runs in its own address space, but as a job, it is well threaded. Threads are real important to understand. Now, when I say it's a job, that means I don't, if you want to start up OS2 in what I call ugly mode, C colon backslash, you can. Go in, seriously, you go into your config sys, change the line where it says PM shell, just say cmd.exe, that's OS2's command processor, and you come up, C colon backslash. And when you want to launch the workplace shell, type in PM shell, and it launches it. It's a very tightly integrated job, but it's just a job. As a job, though, it is threaded, and you have to, we've been talking about threads here. Threads are real important to understand. Basic programming, 101. I write lines of code and I execute them sequentially. Hey, I want to do something different. I'll do perhaps a branch return. I branch over to a subroutine, execute those lines of code, come back to my main thread, continue executing. One single thread of execution. That is DOS, that's DOS Windows, that's even the Macintosh System 7 does not have threads. In OS 2, when you launch an application with threads, I'm working in my process. I want to do something different. I launch a thread to go off and work. It continues to work as this thread continues to work. I can run up to 4,096 concurrent threads. What this means is important is that when I go and work with the workplace shell, look for the hourglass. Watch for the hourglass while I go off and work. You won't see it because I, spend, I spin off a thread to go and do those functions in the background. I'll, I'll show you threads as I go along, but I want to point out we're talking about 32-bit, and 32-bit's important. But I'll tell you that I will take a well-threaded 16-bit application over a non-threaded 32-bit application any time. The way we used to measure response time in the mainframes, when I hit enter on a dumb terminal, it went up, threw it up to the host, came back. When my keyboard unlocked, that was response time, because I can go back and work. Measure response time here, and it pops back on the screen. I have my cursor back immediately because I spawn a thread to go do that, and all of these new machines can handle it. 32 bits important, but multiple threads are more important. Now, excuse me, I'm not a magician, but I do want to uh, grab a glass of water underneath here. Now, now I'm going to go off and do some work with the workplace shell. How many people out there are OS2 users? Yeah, yes. It's, hey, I say yes because a couple of years ago, I never even asked, okay? Now, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and click. One of the things that's new on 2.1 is when I click on... Pardon me? Okay, don't pull it. All right. Now, one of the things that, uh, that's new here, from the backdrop, when I say... I, I can launch the system setup directly from my backdrop menu. One of the things I'm going to do is just quickly show you selective install, some of the new hardware support that's in OS 2. This is real important because OS 2 2.0 didn't have it. Um, some of the things are CD-ROM devices now from CD Technology, Hitachi, IBM CD-ROM 1 and 2, NEC, the new NEC Multispin, Panasonic Pioneer, Sony, uh, Texel, Toshiba, and of course, there is the infamous Other. That's probably the one you have, right? <laughs> now, also, 
SCSI device support from Adaptech, DPT, Future Domain, IBM's AT bus and microchannel bus. I'll tell you that if you go out on CompuServe, there are drivers out there for the Sound Blaster CD-ROM for OS2, the one that hooks on the external of the Sound Blaster, uh, the Mitsumi, uh, I think it's for not Mitsumi, it's uh, about a hundred and some dollar CD-ROM device, there's a driver. DAC, the stereo liquidator, there's a CD-ROM driver, right? <laughs> Hey, this is good for us, it really is. The idea is, is that yes, we sell hardware as the IBM Corporation, but my objective is to get OS2 to run on as many machines as possible, and that's what we plan on doing. Other things that are in here that are new, um, PCMCIA support for the PCMCIA and the portable machines, as well as advanced power management, okay? Now, the, the, the biggest thing out of all of this is that now I can have my OS2 devices and they can be non-IBM devices and, and that's terrific. Oh, by the way, I'll let you know, I got a 4633 here, I've got 16 megabyte of memory because I get it free and uh, <laughs> I'll tell you that I could do this demo in 8 and you would be duly impressed, you really would, it is very impressive in 8. OS2 is minimum on the side of the box it says 4. David Barnes says six is the minimum. I like eight. It's a nice sweet spot and everybody's pretty happy at eight megabyte, okay? Now, I, one of the, oh, there's OS2 users here. You're gonna like this. Let's go ahead and take something. Let me take this application folder here. I'm gonna open up the settings. Anybody wanna go through the steps required to change an icon in OS2? No, I don't either, right? Look how you do it now. You grab an icon, you drag it, you drop it, and it assumes the icon. Yeah. And it can do that, and it doesn't have to be an icon. In fact, now let me show you something else here. I'm going to open up my system folder, open up my drives folder, open up my e drive folder. Notice my cursor? By the way, the gentleman up here before me told me that's impossible. What I just did, did you see an hourglass? I didn't see an hourglass. He said when we open our drives folders that the system's unavailable. It hasn't happened to me, and I use it about 12 hours a day, seven days a week, so I'm not sure what he meant by that. Um, now, when I go up here, and I'll show you, well, here's another example. Let's open up my icons, but while I'm opening up my icons, I'll close this down, go over and close this down. My icons are opening right now. What I just showed you was multiple threads. Also, what he just said can't happen. But I just showed you multiple threads. You never saw the hourglass, right? I could also do the same thing right here. I could just take icons and go ahead and do the association that way. What I really wanted to show you was notice how quickly it popped up. It's much, much, much faster than OS2 2.0. But let's go on and get some applications going here. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to start a DOS application called Popeye. It's a flick file. Actually, it's a fly file. It's, it takes a second to load because it goes into about two megabyte of a DOS memory, right? Now, Popeye, if I do an alt home, I put it in full screen here. The projector has to catch up. Alt home, I put it back in a window. That's true for any DOS application under OS2. Now, why do I show this? <laughs> I do like it, that's one good reason, but one of the other reasons I show it is because he can't, okay? NT can't do this. You notice he said text applications in a window. NT can't put graphics applications in a window, DOS graphics applications in a window, okay? I'm sorry, your bullet said text and your tech conference I went to said text. Okay, we'll ch we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. We'll talk about it then, okay? Let me, let, me, let me say it this way. If you get Windows Magazine, it's the one on the shelf this month, there is a review of NT and OS2 in the magazine, and it's by the, uh, the managing editor of Windows Magazine. He's the news editor. And his, and I quote, says that OS2's DOS support flat out kicks NT's butt. <laughs> quote. That is a quote. And his other quote was that o o NT's DOS support is reminiscent of that of OS2 1.X's DOS compatibility box which we all know was the contemptibility box, right? Yeah, okay. Now, so here's my DOS application, but while Popeye's running, see that OS2 newsletter? I'm launching an application now. I'm launching an application. You see my hourglass? No. Do you see Popeye skip a beat? No. I'm launching a 32-bit OS2 application. This is shrink wrap code. This is by purchasable code right now. This is describe word processor. Popeye continues to run in the background. What I did is I spawned a virtual 86 processor in the chip, and Popeye sits within that virtual 86 processor, runs in the chip. Now, I, by the way, it's going to take a second to put this document on the screen because the border of this thing is about 1.2 megabyte. So I go ahead and put the document up on the screen. And again, this is a describe word processor. I have a Mi Pro OS2 on here. That's not, that's not golden code yet, so I'm not going to show it. I also had WordPerfect for OS2 5.2 on here. But that's not golden again, so I won't show it. I'm only going to show you code you can buy. 
Now, Popeye's sitting out there in a window. What I want to do here is I'm going to go ahead, put my cursor here, do a mark, grab the data on the screen. It's a little difficult to see. Now, we stop Popeye, right? No, this could be a communications program. When I select copy, look where Popeye's at. It's been running the whole time. OS2 doesn't stop your DOS programs. You could have been doing a 9600 baud file transfer. It doesn't want to stop it. It only froze the frame for me. Yes, you can run 9600 baud DOS file transfers in the background while you go and work. I do it all the time under OS2. Works terrifically. I got some of my own internal DOS stuff that we use. Do file transfers, go off and work. Now, that sits out in my clipboard in OS2. I'm going to go back over here, go into my word processor, put my cursor about right here, do an edit and a paste, and there's a cut and a paste from a DOS piece of shareware into a 32-bit OS2 application. Now, that is still in my clipboard. If I wanted to go into a Mi Pro Windows version and paste it, bam, it puts it in there. If I want to go and put it into other applications, the clipboard is common between DOS, Windows, and OS2 applications here. So I can share that data with another DOS application, Windows application, or OS2 application. Now, I want to show you here. Now, this is pretty neat. I clicked on OS2 Newsletter, and that's the name of my file. Now, wait a minute. File names, eight characters dot three characters, right? And directory names, eight characters. And why is that anyway? Why, to be compatible with CPM, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. When DOS was invented by a guy named Tim Patterson, when Tim invented DOS, he wrote the file system to be compatible with CPM, Control Program for Microprocessors. Eight character dot three character. Anybody, and I know there's old CPM users out there. I know there are. And by the way, yeah. And by the way, if you want to run CPM in a DOS box in OS2, it works just fine. I tested it, okay? <laughs> you think I'm a geek, don't you? <laughs> it works. It really does. So now, wait a minute. Now, this is OS2 Newsletter. We blew by that. I use the performance file system. My file name's up to 254 characters. My directory name's up to 254 characters. Oh, but wait a minute. How did I associate this with the program? Because in the Windows world, we say, like, if I click on a .wk1, I'll, I'll launch Lotus. Or if I click on a CDR, I'll launch Corel Draw. But my, word, my file here could be OS2 Newsletter that I created in 1989 when I first moved down to Boca Raton, Florida, and started working on it. 254 characters. It would be sort of silly to put a .wk3 at the end of that, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay. Now, so what do we do in OS2? It's object-oriented. If I open up the settings here, You'll notice what's my, uh, my current data type. It's a describe document. It is an object to OS2. When describe installs, it says, OS2, you're an object-oriented operating system with an object-oriented user interface. I will create a new object type in the system called describe document. Anybody ever clicks on it, launch me. So I don't associate by extensions. It's an object type. There is no object technology like that in NT or is there in the Windows world today, okay? And I'll show you. There's Lotus 1, 2, 3 for OS2. When you install it, it adds the object type. In fact, I'll show you. If you've got, um, let, hey, now I got to tell you, there's some people, IBMers out there, and they have stuff to give away. And they said, man, the logistics of giving this stuff away. And so I said, I'll tell you what, we did this the last time I was at the HAL PC Users Group. When I say, maybe I'll show you, and you say, show me, Dave, they throw trinkets in trash, okay? Can we do that? Yeah. yeah. Show me. Yeah. Okay. Now, I only say trinkets and trash because we have a lot of it. If you don't have any, it's very valuable merchandise. So you say, Dave, do you want to see this? Sorry. Yes, give them stuff. Okay. Now, here's a... Uh... Yeah. Oh, they want it bad. They want it bad. Hey, I got a few minutes to go. Hold off here. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'm launching another... I'm launching another application here. I'm, I'm launching my Relish 32-bit calendaring facility. Okay, back off for a second, guys. I got work to do. Okay, we'll do that again in a couple minutes. How's that? We're going to do that again in a couple minutes. Now, I got my calendaring facility here. I want to show you a function of this. Now, notice that when I launched it, did you ever see the hourglass? No. I had my cursor the whole time. When I say I want to schedule a meeting, let's say I want to schedule a meeting today at uh, something like, well, let's do this again. Let's put a meeting over here at 2 o'clock, and I say I want the meeting from here to here, and here's some information about the meeting, et cetera, et cetera. I select OK, and it puts the meeting there. It says it starts before the current time. That's OK. I don't plan on going there anyway. Now, <laughs> here's another one that it's reminded me of the other day. Here's my favorite feature, defer. It says tell when, and I can say oh, I want it out till then, and select OK. Now, that's before current time as well, so I just go ahead and say cancel, erase that one. As a matter of fact, erase note completely, yes. 
Now, I got the note sitting there. If I had this, or Lotus 1, 2, I'm sorry, a Mi Pro for OS 2 here, I want to put my calendar in my document. I grab it, I drag it, and I drop it. And I put it out on my desktop, and it drags the calendar. In this case, it puts the calendar out on the desktop. Right there it is. There's my other one, and let me go ahead and say, okay, that's fine. I know about the meeting. If I drop this, now I put an object out on my desktop. That's pretty neat. Watch what I do. I'm going to click with the right mouse button. Notice that bottom menu item called CC Mail It. Okay, CC Mail installs an OS 2 and says, you know, you're object oriented. In fact, you're object oriented to the degree that I can reuse OS 2's class libraries. Isn't that what object oriented is all about? Reuse existing code. So, through inheritance, I'll keep all of those menu items up there, but I will subclass the workplace shell menu, and anything that can be sent across the network, I will add CC Mail It. Now, if I go down here, I can't mail this across the network, so when I click on it, Oh, actually, I just launched a command prompt. Let me get that out of there. Don't need it right now. If I click on this, I don't have CC mail it because that can't be sent. It only adds it to objects that can be sent across the network. I go ahead and say I want to CC mail it, and I launch CC mail. Now, this is beta code. The golden code is available for sale. I just haven't got it yet because I've been on the road and I didn't want to download it. So I launch CC mail. There's my CC mail status indicator, my inbox. The cursor is back because I've detached from the system message queue. There's CC mail. There's the information. If I wanted to put in, I wanted to send it to somebody, etc., etc. And if I wanted to send anything else, I just drag it, drop it, and put it on there, and it sends it off with the CC mail message. That, by the way, is impossible in Windows. It's impossible in NT because there's no object-oriented aspect to go ahead, subclass, use workplace shell items like that. Well, there is no workplace shell. Now, let me show you some more about this. Let me get rid of my status indicator here. Now. Popeye's still running. Let me launch, oh, here's one of my favorites, WordPerfect 5.1. I got WordPerfect 6.0 on here, but I like the 5.1 for this. I'm launching it. The projector's got to catch up because I changed video modes. Launch a TSR, and don't you love that? I once said that that was ugly, and I really, not, I should not have because, well, the product manager for WordPerfect 5.1 was in the front row and told me I shouldn't have. <laughs> I took it back, and in fact, IBMers, that is a nice shade of blue, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> And he, and he said to me, he says, he came up later, he said, why didn't you show him the menus? And I said, menus? You have menus? <laughs> For two years, I've been doing F5 and F7. Did you know if you click with the other mouse button, this product had menus? I did not. So I don't know how to use them yet. Let me do an F5, enter, bring a document into here. Now, with Alt Home, I go ahead and put it into a window here. Again, the projector has to catch up with me, with the system. Now. By the way, did you notice what I just did? You know if you click on this bar twice, this is for Windows too. If you click twice, it puts it up to its full size. Click twice again, it brings it back down. It's a little quicker than reaching over there. So I click twice, bring it up. I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna say mark. I'm gonna grab and mark the text on the screen here. Go back up to there and say copy. Put that in my clipboard. Then I'm gonna go back over into my describe document here. Grab the describe document, put it into the foreground. Put my cursor right over in the upper left hand corner. Now by the way, that memory was paged out because it wasn't being used. Let me bring this up to about right here, put my cursor about right there, and do an edit and a paste. And there's a cut and a paste of text from a DOS app to an OS2 app. And again, we can cut from DOS to DOS, DOS to Windows, Windows to DOS, Windows to OS2, OS2 to Windows, DOS to OS2. Well, you get the point, okay? Now, that, by the way, still sits out in my clipboard. I could go ahead and take that and put it out into uh, Lotus123 for DOS if I wanted to. Now, I've got to show you. I'm going to go in with the menus for my DOS program here. You say, show me, Dave. Did you say that? Show me. Yes. So I'm going to do, show me. Now, I'm going to do a file, go to DOS. Anybody got the DOS 6 out there? Okay. And I, oh, I can't pull the audience. I apologize. Okay, most people tell me out of DOS 6, they're getting 620, 630K, which is pretty darn good, and they're happy. But then they load in their land drivers, and then they load in their mouse drivers, and their other TSRs and stuff, and it takes it down. I have all my land drivers loaded. I have all my drivers loaded out of 640K here. What I'm doing is I shell out a WordPerfect in this box. Out of 640K, I have 753. Not bad out of 640, huh? Not bad. Now, how do we do that? When we, built the, when we built the PC in Boca Raton, we said it was not DOS's fault. We said from 640K to a million bytes reserved for system use. As time went on, we gave a big chunk to VGA graphics. The way I use WordPerfect, I don't use VGA graphics. I told OS2 to give it back. 
OS 2's DOS settings are very full function. I clicked on one box, it gave all the VGA memory back to the DOS box. Any text application, 753K. If you go out there and read Byte Magazine this month, Windows Magazine this month, PC Magazine this month, they will tell you that OS 2 runs DOS applications better than anything in the world, period. And I'll tell you, in the past, I was a DeskView fan. Quarter Dex DeskView was the best there was. And I still love DeskView, but this is better. It honestly is. Now, I've got to tell you, one of, the piece, one of the PC magazines, one of the PC magazines said we blew it because we didn't give the capability of doing Alt-Control-Delete to get rid of a bad DOS session. No, I'm sorry. We came up with a new concept. It's called a menu. Yes, select close. It says, are you sure? And it says, yes. I'll do the same thing with Popeye here. Here's how I can go ahead and kill the Popeye in the DOS session. Now, I'll tell you that I'm not going to spend much time on the DOS better than DOS stuff. This is a... Uh, the, the DOS better than DOS is pretty much a given thing. Let me get rid of this down here. Drop it on the shredder. And by the way, that really doesn't shred it. It only recycles it. Now, <laughs> people will actually say to me, now watch, while I open up the Windows apps here, let me go and close down this window here. Multi-threading. One was opening, I closed the other. Multiple threads, it's real important. Well, people say to me, they say, David, why do you want to run DOS? Well, because my father ran DOS and his father before him and by God, okay, <laughs> we give you DOS. Well, why do you want to run Windows? Because it's the only place you can get the Gary Larson Farside calendar. Absolutely, yeah. Now, but that's not for long, because they're working on a 32-bit OS2 version that includes an OS2 tip of the day. Yes! Now, oh, wait a minute. Tomorrow's the joke I think I wanted. Let's go over to the fifth, and I like this one. It says, well, of course I did it. In cold blood, you idiot, I'm a reptile. <laughs> now, so here's a Windows session. What we did here is I created a virtual 86 processor in the chip. All Intel chips from the 386SX up can do this. In the processor, I loaded a copy of DOS, loaded a copy of Windows, load in the application. So we don't have to do much conversion of the Windows code. Now, but wait a minute, what about to display it on the screen? We cut a black hole in the video buffer so that we don't get in the way with any unnecessary CPU cycles. So we let the application go directly to it. Now, as a compatibility test, and purely a compatibility test. Oh, actually, this isn't the one I wanted, but I like it anyhow. Dinosaur cranial capacity. Now, as we go on, let me mention a little bit more about what's going on. So I've got the Windows application running in its own virtual DOS machine. You'll like the next one better. You really will. In fact, it's for the cat that's over there on the other side of the room. Did I tell you you can buy OS2 over there at the door right now? $100 upgrade. $100 upgrade from DOS, and I ask them, what do you do to check to see if they upgraded? And if you know how to do a dir command, you can upgrade. Okay? <laughs> now, now, this is actually the one that I wanted to do for the, uh, for the, for the compatibility test. This is Ant Hill, this Flapcats. Now, I am not a cat lover, but for 15 years... <laughs> for, fi <laughs> ah. for 15 years, my wife said, Honey, can we have a cat? And I said, No, dear, I'm not a big cat fan. But then my two-and-a-half-year-old blonde daughter said, Daddy, can we have a cat? And I said, Why, sure you can, honey. <laughs> Watch the bottom of the screen. The application thinks it's on the Windows desktop. That's fine. It's going to throw the flap cat across to OS2's desktop. That doesn't matter. We can handle it. No problem. Now, I'm going to take this Windows application and minimize it. I'm going to launch another Windows session, another copy of DOS, another copy of Windows, another Windows application in a separate virtual machine. Now, why do I want to do that? Well, you don't want to. If all your applications, Windows applications, are perfectly behaved and they have never failed, run them in the same session. But if you've ever had one Windows application take another one down, you might want to do it this way, because this one is totally isolated from the other. They're protected from each other in separate virtual machines. Now, I want to show you a couple of things we can support. I'm going to launch a Mi Pro here. This is the Windows version of Mi Pro. And I'll tell you, for those of you that don't have OS 2, I hate the fact that I have to re-emphasize this, but our marketing hasn't got the point across. You don't buy Windows, it's on the OS2 diskettes. And you don't buy DOS, it's on the OS2 diskettes, okay? Now, it's, we haven't done a good job of letting people know that. Now, I'm going to open up a document here. Within this document, I can show you object linking and embedding. See the hourglass? Sorry, there's nothing I can do. I'm in a Windows application now. It's single-threaded. <laughs> hey, I am not going to knock Windows applications, folks. I like them as much as you do. I would rather have a multi-threaded OS2 application, but I like these Windows apps, and I can run them. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go down a page. I mean, we all like them, because there's a lot of fun out here. One of the things, an audio person, this sometimes blasts out, we support video for Windows. How do you install it? Same way as any Windows application. You type in setup. So video for Windows goes ahead. 
Okay, you get the point. And to kill this, just do something else, okay? Now, I gotta tell you, this is an absolute, ooh, this is neat. What if this hangs on me? Will you go back over to OS2's presentation manager, the workplace shell? Now, when I bring up the workplace shell, if I double click on here, close that down, go back to my task list. Win OS2, hey, I selected that. If you can select it in the workplace shell, it has a pop-up menu. It says, ooh, do you wanna close it? I say yes. And it says, are you sure? I say yes, and I just killed that Windows session. But what about the Fireside calendar? No, it's in a separate virtual machine. They're protected from each other. And by the way, oh, but NT fixes all that. No, it doesn't. NT runs all Windows 3 applications in the same virtual DOS machine. It can't do what I just showed you. It can't protect them from each other, okay? Not just that. Windows applications, if you're not familiar with them, they do a thing called cooperative multitasking. Any one application can, can take over control of the, of the environment and nothing can stop it. In OS2, those two virtual DOS machines, we preemptively multitask them. So I can run one in the background doing communications, that one that had the video for Windows, I can go ahead and do pictures typistry. I love it. I run it in the background, but it takes hours to create three-dimensional rendering. I leave it in the background and go work. I just hotkey out of there and go back over and work. Oh, let's lighten the air here. Here's one more. This, again, is a cat joke, but I love it. You've heard of aardvarks? Well, these are our dogs. <clears throat> yeah, I love that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got to do one more. This is not... Uh, this, I did this one already. Let me see if I can escape. Yes, I like that. I can escape out of it. Let me do one more, and this would be... Uh, yeah, I think this one here. And it's not cat-related. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Says, whoa, that was a good one. Try it, Hobbs. Just poke his brain right where my finger is. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, oh, I love that. I love that. Now, I tell you, on the way over here, I read Byte Magazine, I read Windows Magazine, and I read PC Magazine. All three of them had articles stating that OS2 runs Windows applications as fast as native Windows and DOS. All three, that's not me talking, that's them. Most people that are using it out there saying it's faster, faster. Now, I want to show you something with the multimedia stuff there. And again, everything I'm showing you, this is shrink wrap code you can do to buy today. I'm going to launch the multimedia code and I'll explain what's happening here. Within OS2, I have the OS2 multimedia presentation manager extensions. What I'm going to show you comes with OS2. Now, I had a university come down to the executive briefing center in Boca out of the East Coast, multi-million dollar multimedia lab. They have uh, PhDs came down there, PhDs, computer science professors. They were going to show us their multimedia lab, then they were going to have us give us the, the, the executive briefing. They had a PS2 Model 95 they brought with them. A Model 95 is massive. It's, it, was, it was a 50 megahertz, 486, 32 megabyte of, of RAM, 256K, a level two cache, and all it had was w video for Windows, Windows and asymmetric toolbook and DOS, okay? They showed us their multimedia presentation. When they started it, it went And they got so extremely embarrassed because it worked yesterday but the multitasking is totally unreliable. It's unpredictable, I think is actually a better word for it. And they were embarrassed, because, and, but why? Because they had PhDs in computer science, okay? And a multimedia, uh, multi-million dollar multimedia lab. I'm gonna actually, instead of play one video thing, maybe I'll play two video things. In fact, in OS2, you can play three, or maybe four, or maybe five, okay? Now, when I show you these, this is pretty neat stuff. Let me close this down so I have a clean screen. Within this one here, I'm gonna do a file open. I'm gonna grab an AVI file. Now, we support let me grab Harley over here. We support both the uh, uh, OS2's all-time motion. That's our codec, compression, decompression. We also support Indio, which is Intel's compression technology. So there's this one over here. And over here, I'm going to do a file open. And let me grab piano over there. Yeah, piano. And it's sort of corny, but it gets the point across. For, you know, this is because it's a non-threaded application. Coders, when you write your code, write threads. The operating system doesn't put in threads by default. The workplace shell is well threaded. The people that wrote that didn't write in threads, and that's bad coding policy, right? And it takes a while to get used to threads, but after a while, it's going to be a lot better for all the applications. Now, I'm going to do a play here. I'm going to grab the target. Now, I'll tell you, we can play 30 frames a second at this. Now. Let me go ahead and put this in the size that video for Windows plays it in, the size that OS2 can play it in, or the size that you really want it in. Okay? 
This isn't software. There's no hardware here. Yes! Okay, now, that was created, I'll tell you that that was created at, um, that was created at 6, or at 1024, 768. I am 644 80, and that's the reason behind the, low, the bad resolution. The resolution was originally 320 by 200. I just blew it up to 644 80. So this was the normal resolution. This is software decompression. There's no hardware involved here. Now, over here, let's go ahead and start this piano playing. Again, it's a little corny. Watch the fingers. Listen to the music and watch the fingers. Macintosh can't do this. Microsoft can't do this. Amiga can't do this. Look over here. Let's start up the Harley ad. Watch the fingers. There's not another technology that can touch this. And I can start more. Now I gotta tell you, I gotta wait for the Harley ending because I like that part. Where the motor starts? Yeah. Everybody loves a hog. Okay, now, I gotta tell you, Byte Magazine, last month, it was the issue that has fatware on the cover. There's a review of the OS2 multimedia extensions by a guy named Tom Yeager. He wrote the multimedia encyclopedia for Macintosh, Amiga, and the IBM PC. Now, the Amiga people have always said, we've always been able to do that, right? So this, this gentleman to me, the multimedia encyclopedia, his recommendations, OS2, the strongest multimedia environment in the world today, period. And that, to me, was pretty good. There's no doubt, it's great. Now, I'm gonna show you one more thing. Let me launch, show now, me. show me, Dave, yeah! Yeah, yeah! Now, <laughs> what I showed you right there was, what I showed you was video. That comes with OS2. The stuff that I just showed you, the multimedia extensions come with OS2 2.1. You know, and I don't even know what they're throwing out out there. Is there any cash coming out there? Cash, cash. Now. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run some audio. And I want to see if you hear it skip a beat or if you see the hourglass. Let's crank some audio here. In fact, let me bring this up a little bit because I have control of the volume right here. Let's crank it up, but then I'll go work. See if you hear it skip a beat. Look for the hourglass. Oh, let's go a little louder. Yeah, now let's take this down. Let's go and work. No magic here, folks. This is coming off my hard disk. No dancing, please. The fire heart will pass. Let's go ahead, open up the program all at the same time. But do you see, now, where did my music go? No! This has happened to me once before, and I gotta tell you, David's not a happy fellow. This has happened before, and it can actually hang me up. And I did it, I did it to myself. So you say, so you say, show me, Dave. Watch what I show you here. And I'm going to show you while this comes up, and I know exactly why this happened. Dave's doing a nasty thing here. The video clips that I wanted to show you, those aren't supposed to run with the multimedia stuff that I wanted to show you, but that Harley thing turns me on, okay? So what I just did was, and one of the ways that you can hang hardware in OS2 is it's a bad device driver, and so I had to keep an old device driver in. I'm going to reboot my system right now. I don't like that, but I have to do it. I'll tell you, though, one of the things that's going to happen, I want to explain what's going on along the way, and it gives me an opportunity to tell you where we're going to be going next. I've got to go through my whole 16 megabyte and all that stuff and power on password. Then OS2 is going to do a check disk. Because I use the high-performance file system, though, and by the way, NT supports high-performance file system, too, because Microsoft wrote it, the, uh, while I go and run the high-performance file system, it's going to find some things on my hard disk. It might find clusters that in the DOS world, it would say, they're broken, they're gone. In the OS2 world, it's going to say, they're broken, I'm going to fix them. Yeah. Now, I got a 400 meg hard disk here. It's going to take a second to do this. So as soon as I get the key indicator up there, somebody tell me so I can do a password. It is a good opportunity, though, for me to tell you where we're going next from here. I'm going to talk about Taligen in a moment. Taligen's pretty important. Taligen's pretty far out. Taligen's out there where Cairo is. It's far, well, it's farther along than Cairo, certainly. And I'll tell you where Cal... No, only but I say that because Apple started working on the, the, the kernel for the Taligen operating system, Pink, about five years ago. Okay, they started into it quite early. And that's one of the reasons why we teamed up with them on it. Let me see if I get myself started up here. Yeah, and there I go. I'm going off to do the check disk now. Now, 
OS2, like you see right here, does not run symmetric multiprocessing. And I apologize for that, sort of. How many people need it on their desktop today? That depends. Not too many people need it on their desktop. NT is going to come with symmetric multiprocessing on every machine. With OS2, you can buy it separately. If you went to Comdex, you saw OS2 running on four Pentium processors in the Intel booth. You saw OS2 2.1, this code right here, running on two 486s on an AST machine in the IBM booth, two 486s on an ALR machine in the IBM booth, symmetric multiprocessing. We're going to ship that this year for those who need it. We are also going to be able to have security in OS2. OS2, as you see it here, will never be as secure as NT. NT, the security, is in the base kernel, and that's where it should be. OS2 will have security. We will be doing file level locking and that kind of thing. We will sell it to those that need it as an add-on. What's coming next from OS2, though? A thing called the Workplace OS. It is built upon the Carnegie Mellon Mach 3 kernel. We took their kernel, altered it, and called it the IBM kernel. It's an open kernel. The Carnegie Mellon Mach kernel then, by the way, see my, my described document was open, right? In fact, I saw one of your LPC magazines that says problems because you've got an open file handle and you lose power and you're dead. No, not in the high performance file system. You fix it. It found it and it's going to fix it. Now, Power OS, Workplace OS will run on RISC processors and it will run on CISC processors. In other words, 386, 486 Pentium, as well as RISC processors. Right now, Power Open is one of them. It will support OS2 applications as they are right now with the same API. We don't have five sets of APIs. We have one, the Workplace Shell and OS2's Presentation Manager APIs. These applications will work on Workplace OS. OS2 applications. Well, what about Unix applications? Yes, we will support AIX applications running Motif. We will support Mac applications, not in the first release. Mac applications, I like that. We will support DOS and Windows applications. The Workplace OS will boot up on the kernel on a RISC or CISC processor. And then we have what we call schizophrenic. Again, it's a 400 meg hard disk. It takes a second. We have what's called schizophrenic operating system in that we can have multiple personalities. These personalities, this is pretty neat stuff. These multiple personalities allow, now, I also have to tell you, OS2 is going to start everything that was running. Okay? Everything that was running, it's going to go off and start right now. And that can be bad, because what if it starts up the thing that you didn't want it to start up? Yeah, then what you do is once you get the hourglass, you hold Control Shift F1 and say bypass that. You can also turn it off yourself, okay? But when OS2 comes up, if you don't want it to start up all of the jobs, I mean it's going to start up everything, you can actually go and bypass that. So the Workplace OS, is OS2 uh, uh, a direct uh, talent, or uh, an NT knock? No. No, and most of the stuff you told me about NT sounds like it's going to be a good server. But every magazine I read today said it needs 16 megabyte and 100 mega hard disk. And I'll tell you, the magazines say OS2 run at 4 mega, and I tell you it won't. I like 8. And OS2, yes, OS2 can load in as low as 13 mega hard disk, but I think you should give it 40 if you're going to install everything, which is what I showed you. It's not a direct competitor with NT. I'll tell you that I will put this on my desktops. I will put this on my end users' desktops. And NT, I don't know, maybe, in a, maybe but not in release 1, for, certainly. Now, I start up, I, and hey. Any operating system, I don't care whose it is, any operating system, it takes a while to get it all ironed out. And in NT, it's the first ever of anything of its sort. It's the first portable, multi preemptive multitasking operating system, and it's going to take a while to bring it out. This, by the way, has taken five years, and it's finally smooth. Now, here's my describe document. It says, do I want to restore? Oh, now, this is pretty neat. When I'm running describe and I'm typing away, you know how I can take a snapshot of what's in the background while you're typing, but sometimes you get a pause? Not in an OS2 application because it launches a thread to do that. You don't even know that it takes a snapshot. It's going to go ahead and bring in that document. Describe will have saved the text. It didn't save Popeye, though. For some reason, describe cho chooses not to save the bitmaps as it puts it out there. Now, I'm going to go ahead and load it in the describe document. Go ahead and see what else is running in the background here. Let's see. I've got my MMPM extensions loaded here. Oh, somebody said, show us. You're getting hungry out there. Let me go ahead and load this. This says I got 32 mega memory. That's virtual. That's not real. That includes my swap space out on the hard disk. There's my screensaver that was running. Let me get rid of that. Let me go back over here, bring up the MMPM extensions that I was going to play here. Here's my multimedia apps. Here's my movies and sound. Go one more time and load that sound in here. Here's pump it up. And let me grab some sound. Go ahead and start and play it again. 
Now, and again, I was going to put on Hammers Can't Touch This, but I like this one too. And it was out there right now. So, let's start that up again. Let's start the music. Let's get some volume. Let's close this. Let's close this. Let's do this now. Go in with Dawson here. Bring up the Dawson on the screen. Close down this window. Now, we've got how many DOS applications do we have to work concurrently? If this did it again, I'm going to be real happy. Good, it did it. Good, it did it. Thank you, thank you. Now, I'm going to start one. I'm going to start two. But do I have the hourglass? No, I'm going to close these. While I'm launching the DOS applications, grab these, go ahead and cascade them, put them up here at the same time, Take this, minimize it over there. Got my OS2 logo. There's some DOS fly files that are all running concurrently. Three different DOS applications running concurrently on my desktop while I'm running music in the background with my digital audio. That's preemptive multitasking. That's the best DOS support of anything in the market today. And that's why I like it. Yeah! Now... I got to tell you, when you go out and record music in OS 2, I recorded, and I, re I did this in uh, another environment, and it, after I got into some music, it said, sorry, I'm out of memory. In OS 2, keep your file sizes under 4 gigabyte, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Seriously. And, and NT, high, high performance file system and the NT file system are such great improvements. Okay, let's do some OS 2 applications. Now, I got to show you. We talked about app. Show me, Dave. They want more stuff. They're hungry. Now, while I open that window right there, let me close this window here. This one's got a lot of icons on the screen. There they go. There they go. Now, I'm going to go ahead and launch Lotus 1, 2, 3 for OS 2. I got to show you something. See the hourglass here? The Lotus people don't have to do that. I showed you two other applications. They disconnect from the system message queue and let me go work. So I went to them and said, why do you do that? They want you to see who it's registered to. These are the people that two years ago still used copy protection. Yeah, okay. So now that was just purely coding. It was not because of OS2. Now here's a Windows application, or OS2 application. This is 32-bit OS2. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up within this application a desktop. What a desktop is here is I'm not just opening up Lotus 1, 2, 3 here. I'm also opening up freelance graphics for OS 2. Now, wait a minute. Those are two separate products. Yeah, but when you install them in OS 2, it says, hey, Lotus is already installed on your hard disk. Since I can reuse those same dynamic link libraries in the same code, why don't I just install in the same subdirectories and take three megabyte less data? Now, when I install, I've got freelance down here and Lotus is up, what work, my worksheet is up there. My worksheet is in the foreground, so I got worksheet icons. When I click down here, now I've got freelance icons. Those are smart icons. It's editing in place. And by the way, that's part of what will be in OLA 2.0. This is a shipping 32-bit application right now. It's called editing in place, okay? Now, I, I hate, and I like OLA too. Don't think we won't grasp onto that standard sooner or later. You didn't hear it from me, okay? But we got some other things. We got some other things. Now, here's my, my worksheet in the foreground. I'm going to click on the graph icon. Lotus takes the data off this worksheet. It brings up a graph that it thinks best represents my data. When the graph is in the foreground then, I go ahead and click on the edit and copy. Now watch how quickly. Bam! OS2's clipboard, 512 megabyte, which means however big your hard disk is. Now understand, this is virtual. You have to have hard disk space for it. I had some people go, but I thought it was virtual. No, 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 no. It has to exist somewhere so it exists out in your hard disk, okay? <laughs> now, that is sitting out there on my, uh, in my uh, clipboard. I'm going to bring back up Describe here. I'm going to take Describe, put it side by side with the Lotus 1, 2, 3. And now this is pretty neat stuff. It's sitting out there in the clipboard. I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to take this and put about right here. I'm going to do an edit. Instead of a paste, I'm going to do a link paste link. So I take the data from my clipboard, put it in there, but I also create a dynamic data exchange link back. You know what I like about this product? Unlimited undo. Edit undo. And when I mean unlimited, I mean thousands, folks. And I'm not kidding. You can really do that. Let me go back here. Go back here. Select OK. I wanted to put it there. So let me do it one more time. Do an edit link, paste link, put it back onto my desktop and put it in the right place. Now, when I go back over here, when I click on the graph, now I have graph icons. When I click over here on the pie chart, make it a pie chart, bam. 
You're going to be, yeah, yeah. Now, this is better though. This is better. Let's take this and in the short amount of time I have, because I'm probably over, do you want me to show you more? Yes! yes! Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a 32-bit preemptive multitasking, multi-threaded application with object-oriented code and I don't program. This is pretty neat. Now, wait a minute. Who invented, who invented this iconic user interface? Microsoft? No. Apple? No. Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Now, where did some of those smart people go? They started a company called Digitalk. They invented Smalltalk, the first object-oriented programming language for the PC. Their second product, big product, is this, parts. Now, I've got to tell you, you, a lot of people look at the OS2 workplace shell and they say, you know, this looks a lot like a Macintosh, David. Is this part of the IBM-Apple relationship? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but what I can tell you, as part of the uh, IBM-Apple relationship, right now, I'm not wearing socks, okay? <laughs> now, uh, actually, let me get on. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to build an application. I'm going to put this window element up in place because it's a visual application. You need to have a window element. Let me scale it a little bit bigger. I'm going to go along here. Now, this is pure 32-bit OS2. Notice those folders and things? That's all workplace shell stuff. I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to scroll through the folders. Uh, actually, let me go back a page, right there. I'm going to grab this thing here called a dial pane. I grab it and drag it and drop it, put it out on my folder here. Let's put it up about right there. Then I'm going to grab this thing called a horizontal slider and I'm going to put it about right over here. Now, wait a minute. You're saying, David, this is an interface builder. We've seen a lot like it, but we have to go and write the business code behind it. No, you don't. That's why this is neat. Look at this. So is Dave. Thank you. Let me go ahead and put a line between... I'm going to put a line between there and there, and I'm going to say when this value, let me put it up so you can see it. When this value is changed, set the value there. When I go here, I'm going to say when this value is changed, set the value there. If I want to test the application, I click on launch. I bring the application up. Let's move the dial. Bam. That's it. Okay? Now, but let's go further. These little lines here mean that everything's cool. If something was wrong, the line would be red, so I'd know immediately something was wrong. Well, how do I work with it? Click with the right mouse button. It's an object. It has a pop-up menu. All objects have a pop-up menu. Now, as it is, that thing is just fine, so I'm going to click on the no lines there, make those go away. Then I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to scroll back a page. If you scroll down, this says it's an energy entry integer entry field, except digits. So I grab this, drag it, and drop it over there. Now, I'm going to put a line between here and here that says when this value is entered, I guessed that meant the enter key, set the value there. Select OK, go ahead and launch it. From there, I can put it up here, put in a value of 65, hit enter, update this, update that. Okay? Now, but let's go further with this. This is neat. How do I link it to an application? You click on the interface icon. If I wanted to launch the application, I put it there. And I say when this is launched, start Lotus 1, 2, 3 and describe. Don't have to because they're already running, so I can get rid of that. But as it is, this one here says DDE client. I put it on my workbench. The user never sees it. It's a non-visual part, so I put it over there. Now, this is the part I had to open the book for. I had to say, whoop, let me put this back. I had to find out that when you do this, you say, when the application is opened, initiate dynamic data exchange. And when the application is closed, terminate dynamic data exchange. Now, what am I going to DDE with? Well, if you double click on an object in OS2, it opens up its settings. I'm going to DDE with Lotus, and the name of the spreadsheet was um, graphic numbers. I am not a touch typist. Well, I do touch it, but that's about all. <laughs> dot WG2. Yes, spaces are valid in those long file names, but I still use dot WG2 because, well, it's a bad habit. Now, I'm going to put it into cell B4 in the spreadsheet. Now, I could say put things in one cell and take things out of another cell. That's done. All I have to do is say, when this value is changed here, I want to put it in cell B4. Select OK. Go ahead and launch the application from right there. Go ahead and minimize this. Bring up Lotus123 over here. Bring up Describe Word Processor over there. Bring this to the foreground. When, you bring, when I bring this up, notice, by the way, the spreadsheet cell that I'm going to is the one that's in yellow. It's over here. It is cell, um, bring the spreadsheet to the foreground. Where's cell B4? This is going to take a second to bring up there. There's cell B4, okay? So let's take this. Let's add a value here of 64, 63. Hit enter. Update this. Update that. Update that. Update that. Bam, and I link. Update that graph. Now. Thank you. Now. Yeah, yeah. Now watch this. Watch this. 
Watch the cell, watch the cell in the spreadsheet. You want to see fast interprocess communications? Let's change this. OS2 2.1 is fast. That's pure and simple. Now, here is the really neat part. This is my favorite part. Now, wait a minute. Now, you haven't created an application. You built that little thing there. What do I do to make this into an application? You select File, Save as EXE. It's done. It's finished. It's an executable program. Even better. It's object-oriented, which means I want to be able to reuse it or let a peer reuse it. So I drag it over and drop it in the catalog. It's now a reusable part. That's neat. And if you ask me, what is Taligent? Taligent is what you just saw there with the operating system components. With Taligent, this is what you're going to do with the operating system printer and communication stuff. You're going to build your own applications. But then you're going to say, I want this virtual reality node that's available from this company. It's a framework. And you'll buy it, and you'll plug it into your tool, toolkit over there, and you'll build from that. And that's why it's going to take a couple years to get it out there in full force and running. Tools will be coming this year. You need the tools first. But is that going to replace OS2 everywhere? Is that going to? No. There's still going to be workstations running OS2 to get their work done. New applications will want the Taligent. But in the meanwhile, I can run my DOS, Windows, and OS2 applications very reasonably. And that's all I really want to do. And I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. We have three microphones here, the front, the middle, and the back. But before you ask your questions uh, to our guests, I'm going to ask you some questions. Listen up here. <clears throat> How many of you have 8386 or any other 32-bit computers at home or at work? Obviously, it is not really a 32-bit system if it is running just DOS or Windows. So I'm going to ask how many of you are going, uh, are now running a full-bore 32-bit operating system, either OS2 or Windows NT or Nova or something, something exotic. How many of you are running 32 bits already? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions about your feeling about 32-bit about operating systems right now. I'm going to ask you, how many of you plan to get NT right away, just as soon as possible? <laughs> how many of you plan to get OS2 right away or just absolutely as soon as possible? Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask you the maybe questions. How many are going to wait for NT or some other Windows uh, operating system in, in the later versions that were discussed? How many are going to wait for OS2 or Next Step or Solaris or Taligent or, or any other thing uh, and, and stick with DOS and Windows NT for the time being? Okay, last question. How many of you are going to die as a DOS virgin and you're never going to touch this stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's DOS virgin, not DOS version. Okay. Thank you for ask, answering our questions. And now uh, we'd like to entertain your questions for either one or both of our uh, guests. You get one question, not a series of questions, and uh, so I'll take the first uh, question from the middle microphone, sir. You got it. By the way, I must compliment you on your name, Dave. It's an excellent name. Uh, that happens to be mine, too. And I like your speaking voice. Thank yes. you. Anyhow, I run DeskView. I run uh, three nodes of a BBS on DeskView. I run Windows applications on DeskView. And I have maxed out all my drivers and everything. I'm back to about 530K at the bottom 640. Tell me, Dave, what can I do? I'll tell you, the, uh, first of all, there's a lot of good OS2 BBSs out there. I know you got what you want right now, but there's some good OS2 bulletin board software out there that runs real well. 
There are, there are drivers out there. You know how DeskView has, uh, has some small drivers to allow DeskView to know when to switch and how? Those things work under OS 2. There has been code written so that those, those indicators that let DeskView know, hey, I need slight, those things can work under OS 2. Darn near every DOS app you can put at OS 2 you can run. Even on the high-performance file system, all my DOS and Windows programs were out there. Stay 8.3 for your DOS programs, but there isn't much of what you can't run there. You got any more specifics? Because I, I am. Yeah. I'd love what, to what about what about higher transfers than 96? Oh, one question. Okay, I'm sorry. I, that was a clarification. High transfer rates. Your DOS applications in OS 2 2.0. You could run a DOS application at 9600 baud. When you started the second one, you got some timeouts. That has been corrected in OS 2 2.1. We've allowed more interrupts per second, so I can run multiple 9600 baud background sessions underneath OS 2 2.1. Okay. Next question. Front microphone. Uh, does version one, uh, or rather 2.0, uh, support SCSI drives? Version 2.0 of OS2 supports SCSI, yeah, but there weren't as many drivers out there. These drivers, if you wanted to get those out, you mean version 2.1 now? No. 2.0. The older version. The older version does support them, and all of these drivers will work there. You just have to get them out of here and put them in there. These drivers, OS2, unlike NT, OS2 supports 16-bit and 32-bit drivers. So we'll support any 16... We even support your DOS device drivers in your DOS virtual DOS machines. So yes, we support the SCSI drives. I've been using my SCSI wait, drive. That's wait, what wait, I have on here. Wait, 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 wait. Um, the drivers aren't with it, though. Okay? Now, you support 32-bit device drivers and 16-bit. Now, do you run 32-bit Windows applications? The question, I think, is probably going to be on the Win32S running in a VDX machine. Right. When, PC Week, by the way, lists all three applications that exist on Earth that need that in this issue. No, we don't yet. We can, and we're evaluating it, but those three applications, Carbon Copy, MathCAD, and one other, we cannot run, and those are the only three. The rear microphone. Uh, do you support the Stacker program or the extra drives? Yes, yeah, Stacker for OS2 is available and shipping for the FAT file system. It's golden code and it's advertised right now in PC Week, etc. Stacker for the high performance file system is not shipping yet. Don't use your DOS stacker on OS2 is high OS2 or NT, right? Is that correct? Don't use your DOS stacker. You hurt yourself. It does not. So you need a stacker and, and NT's got your compression in it already, correct? Yeah. NT has some disk compression. Stacker for OS2, FAT is shipping. High performance file system soon to be shipping. There's another product called DCF Disk Compression Facility that's been shipping for about eight months. And that's for OS2 as well. The middle microphone. Thank you. Dave, I've been a happy OS2 user for quite some time. And if I move up to 2.1, am I going to be able to preserve all the customization that I've done in my workplace shell? Yeah. If you install OS2, you can install it on top of DOS and Windows. And by the way, keep it if you want to for the safe time, right? And then later on, when you know everything runs, get rid of it. You can, uh, it will take your Windows as it is and migrate your Windows desktop so it looks the same. It'll take your OS2 workplace shell and migrate it. Don't install OS2 on top of beta code, though. I mean, that, you're, you'll have a problem down the road and you'll wonder, was that why? But so on top of OS2 2.0, 2.0 with the service pack, OS2 1.3, DOS or Windows, yes. Beta code, don't do it. Okay? This is for the, this is for the NT folks. Um, basically, I didn't notice, I noticed that you didn't run any DOS applications under NT. What I've been seeing in the media is uh, performance degradation of between 25 and 1200 percent of DOS applications, un DOS and Windows applications under OS, excuse me, under NT. And I wanted to find out what you, if you're doing anything to improve that or if that's the way it's going to be when the final product comes out. Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of the initial uh, offerings and testing that have been done on NT, this microphone up, uh, a lot of the evaluations that have gone on in NT were based on the uh, April and, and March builds of NT. Uh, the, We've been code complete now since the end of the year. And we've, all we've done, or all we've concentrated on since the end of the year, is performance testing and performance tuning and DOS applications. Uh, the April build is about twice as fast as the March build. Uh, the goal is to run applications as fast, DOS applications as fast as OS2. Um, I mean, it should. We wrote the OS2 stuff. I mean, initially, all, the pro all that stuff came from Microsoft. So 
Yes, we will run DOS applications just as fast. The goal is you will not notice any performance degradation whatsoever in your DOS apps. Uh, we'll support communication modes a lot higher than 9600 for DOS apps also. The rear microphone. This is, I guess, a question for both of you. I'm trying to, I'm about to write some uh, software to access a mainframe, but for security reasons, I want to take the data, drop it down into a file on the disk. The program I'm writing is, in, is Windows based, it's Visual Basic. So what I want to be able to do is, with a separate routine, do a, uh, I believe it's called a synchronous uh, file transfer to the mainframe, which is tricky in Windows. I want to be able to do that, though, taking the information to a file and then access it with my Windows program. Right. Can that be done? Is it tricky to do in either NT or OS2? It's, it's, you can do it in NT or in OS2. Uh, there, what I would recommend, though, is there are visual basic libraries and custom controls that have the 3270 file transfer APIs already in there that will run those as Windows programs in the background. I'm not going to be able to use 3270, though, in this case. Okay. Let me add also, in OS2, each of those DOS boxes, although they're shielded, they're not totally. You can use named pipes out of a DOS box, call an OS2 program, call it, initiate it, and use it to do your file transfer, and then named pipes is supported in OS2 2.1 from DOS to OS2 or from DOS to Windows programs. Will I, will I be able That's to it. Thank read you. that? Will I be able to read that file, though? Thank you. Yeah, yes. see me afterwards. I'll hang around and talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Middle microphone. Yeah, Dave. Can I take you uh, at your word when you said I can get it right now? I understand PC People has several boxes of OS2, but you have said you will not release it until uh, the 14th of this month. Mm -hmm. Can you. I buy it now? You know, for some reason, yeah, IBM marketing is still really trailing. Microsoft's kicking our butt as far as marketing, folks. There's no doubt about it. Somebody in IBM said they can have it on the shelves, but they can't sell it. Anybody in marketing think that's stupid? <laughs> okay. Yep. Yes, PC people is not supposed to sell it until the 14th. I don't know why. Our 800 number says they're shipping immediately, but I got a feeling that if you did that, you'd get it about the same time. They got the code. It's here, and that's a marketing issue, and that's one of the things I am working on in IBM. We got all new people. It's going to get better. Okay? Yeah, it's the 14th. Um, <clears throat> front mic. Yes. Does the CD version of OS2 come with Describe 4.0? Now, the CD version of OS2 comes with the multimedia extensions, but not Describe. Describe 4.0, you can get an eval copy of it, full function, except there's like two things it can't do, so you can evaluate the whole thing 32-bit on CompuServe. Go OS2 user, and it's out there. And you, it's one diskette, multi-threaded everything. Thank you. Um, the middle microphone. That's a question for Doug. We've, uh, we're a solution provider. We've been developing under NT for almost a year, and we absolutely love it. Um, I have a question for Microsoft, though. Why hasn't Microsoft gone ahead and ported Excel, WinWord, and other popular applications straight away to a 32-bit environment, not waiting to multi-thread and so forth, so we could use it to build solutions immediately like uh, all the other third-party software vendors? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the question was, uh, why, hasn't we, why haven't we released 32-bit versions, or when are we going to release 32-bit versions of these applications? Uh, we're committed to delivering all of our application suite on top of NT. Uh, what you will see, though, is as, as the next product is released, there will be a 32-bit version included in that. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm giving away too many secrets here, I think we'll see a version of uh, Word for Windows sometime uh, early fall or late summer. We might see a version of Excel sometime uh, around that. And, and the reason that's happening is we're going to core code in all of our applications so that when we develop an application, we can deliver it simultaneously on the Macintosh, Windows 16, and Windows 32-bit. The rear microphone. Um, this question is directed to uh, both parties. Um, currently, um, I can listen to mod files, which is a uh, sound, and I also use the modem, but I can't do it current, concurrently uh, with, with, with Windows. Um, I would like to know if I can both listen to um, music and do modem transfers at the same with uh, your software. Your operating system. What, what I just did there by playing those two music sessions, I'll tell you, I can play music, I can play video, I can do remote file transfer, be on a local area network, run DOS and Windows programs at the same time, and I really do it. 
I think that answers the question there. Yeah, NT gives you all those capabilities also. Uh, purely multitasking, purely multi-threaded. Uh, so you can do multiple things simultaneously. All the input queues are asynchronous and they're all uh, uh, not linked together so that you can do multiple things without locking another application. I mean, if you'll notice, it was, uh, there was an hourglass sometimes on the OS2. Uh, what we do instead is when we launch an application, we refer to, well, we, we have a new cursor. It's referred to as a start cursor. So you still have your little cursor and you have a little hourglass drop on the bottom of it. And what, that makes, what that's telling you is that the application is starting. So we're giving you some input and some feedback on the fact that application is starting and then you can go do something else. Thank you. The front microphone. I have a question for both operating systems. Uh, what about remote control software and floppy tape backup? Okay. Uh, from an NT perspective, uh, let me take the tape backup first. Uh, tape backup software is included in the NT package. Floppy tape backup. Pardon me? Floppy. Tape floppy backup. tape backup and uh, regular tape. There's, uh, there's floppy backup included and there's tape backup. Floppy included. controlled tape drives. Tape drives that run off the floppy controller. Tape drive that you run off the floppy controller. There are a lot of them out here. Uh, I'm not sure on NT. Okay. I'd have to. OS2. There's one called Backmaster. There's one from SciQuest. Um, you had another, there was, there was two parts to that question. Remote control. The remote control. Poly PM has been shipping for over a year in the U.S. and in Europe. OS2 is a lot bigger in Europe. Uh, I got Poly PM on here and it's nice. I take over the whole workplace shell. It's as if I was right there. There's another one called Copycat that just went into beta from Hillgrave Associates. They make hyper access and they just went into beta with them. Poly PM has been shipping for a while. Uh, APPC, um, NetBIOS, um, asynchronous, I can dial up from home and take over, all of them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, NT has all those capabilities. We have uh, remote administration. I can actually change the configuration remotely while the user is still using the package and they don't even realize it. I can also upgrade the operating system remotely. So I can force a new version of the operating system down to the user's desk and the user never knows that it happens. He gets a dialog box that pops up that says, your operating system has been upgraded. Please reboot your machine now. By the way, we've had that in OS2 for about eight months, shipping. The rear microphone. This is an OS2 question. Say I'm in a full screen DOS session without using a TSR. Is there a product to hotkey out of it into any application, say on the window or into another full screen? Also, is there a macro language product available for the workplace shell? Okay, first of all, Rex is available for OS2 and it fully exploits the workplace shell and its object-oriented capabilities. It's 32-bit. It's in OS2. Uh, people tell me they absolutely love it. As far as the hotkey capability, I don't think I got your question. I can enable, I got a couple of programs that use control, sh or, uh, control escape and alt escape. Well, if I do that in OS2, OS2 intercepts it. In OS2's DOS settings, you can say, give this to the DOS program. Right. But I I'm not sure I got your question. One hotkey. One hotkey. One hot There's software out on CompuServe right now that'll allow one hotkey anywhere in OS2. It's shareware. I think it's 25 bucks. You're going to sign a hotkey to do darn near anything you want in the workplace shell. Thank no. you. Thank you. The middle microphone. I'm an OS2 user. I've been OS2 user 2.0 for quite some time, 1.3 uh, before that. Still I'm using FAT and just have not trusted uh, H, uh, PFS. What am I going to lose uh, other than the long file names uh, by keeping uh, my file system as FAT? Or okay. is FAT still available? FAT is definitely still available. We now call it super FAT. We've, we've improved its performance significantly. It really is a lot faster. Okay? A, lot of my peers, a lot of my peers still use the FAT file system. I went HPFS because in South Florida we get power hits like crazy and I got tired of losing stuff. I also like the long file names. Since I went, I'd say about a year ago, I, there's nothing that doesn't run. All my DOS and Windows programs run. But if I take a DOS diskette and boot it, it can't even find my hard disk. So I have an OS2 diskette. Okay? And you can create that now. Um, downside would be you can't dual boot to pure DOS. That's the one downside. Other than that, it's stable. Um, it's, uh, I, I absolutely love it. And I, I, when I poll people in users groups and I say who uses it, they raise, they're adamant. They're lovers of it. Okay? Smaller sector size. 
I've got icons out here that would take 16 meg on your fat file system. They take 8 meg on mine. 512. Yeah, yeah. The wow. rear microphone. Hi, uh, this question is directed to Dave. Well, first of all, you did a very good presentation. Thanks. And uh, you virtually steal the show. <laughs> well, um, the main concern of uh, not moving to OS2 uh, for me is the the programs that is native to OS2 is so is so limited, yeah. and I don't even see any store uh, software store have a section of OS2 yeah. software programs. So uh, I want to know how many programs currently available and will be available. Um, I, I just I'm want with, a number and yeah, also I, I want to I'm know. with you. I'll tell you right now there are 1200 OS2 32-bit apps. But if you look at them, it's not something you and I want. It's accounts receivable, accounts payable, billing inventory. Because corporations, Social Security Administration just bought 70,000 copies of OS2 to revamp the Social Security Administration. Prudential, 40,000 copies. Merrill Lynch, 40,000. The corporations are getting the applications. You and I want the fun stuff. I would love to have Excel and Word. Wouldn't y'all for OS2? Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're not there yet. I'll tell you that we have a group in IBM that's going out there paying people to write code. It works. What the heck? We're not in the application business and we're not going to compete against them. We're going to give them money and help them and bring them to Boca and teach them how. And it's the chicken and the egg. There's just about three million copies here. There'll be four million soon. People are then going to want to write applications. I, I'd like to Thank address you. that just for a second. Uh, we've sold 65,000 developers kits for Windows NT in less than nine months. Okay, 65,000. We did an internal survey of those. 75% of them plan on delivering applications in the first 12 months. Okay, so that is a ton of 32 bit Windows applications that will be available. There's this pent up demand in the industry for, the, for a modernized, microkernel type of approach to an operating system, purely 32 bit, no limits on the system. Uh, there's no thread limit in NT, there's just none, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's multi-user, multitasking. Uh, we have a catalog now. There's over 1,500 vendors that have already committed to delivering Windows 32-bit applications. So there's a, there'll be a lot of Windows 32-bit applications available. And I don't mean just tools. I mean basic applications and productivity tools that you use every day. The middle microphone. This, <clears throat> this is an OS2 uh, question. Uh, are the database manager uh, and the communications manager uh, differ? Do they differ in 2.1 compared to 2.0? Now, Same. OS2, Database Manager, and Communications Manager, they used to be together called Extended Services. Now we separated them. Actually, they were, yeah. They, now there's DB slash 2 and, and the CM slash 2. They function under 2.1 without change. You can go with your existing code. It functions under here. In fact, that took us a little while to get that done because there's so much function there, but it works. Thank okay? You. The front microphone. One of the biggest things that's keeping me from going to 2.1 or 2.0 uh, OS2 is IBM support. Uh, they're known to be very slow in getting things uh, fixed or answering their questions. Or Microsoft has been, I think, excels in that. Mm -hmm. What is IBM doing to yeah. alleviate that? If, yeah, thank, that, the, the, re, the remark was regarding our support. And I'll tell you that I get mixed reviews. Some people say good, most people say bad. They, get, they don't get the callbacks, etc. Uh, if you read this week's PC Week, what we tried to emphasize at Comdex was that we're not just uh, IBM OS2. We're personal software products. We just hired 1,500 people within the last couple of weeks. We're having a boot camp that starts next uh, to Monday down in Orlando. 500 OS2 people for the US, brand new OS2 people, another 1,500 on top of that. And to tell you the truth, we brought in WordPerfect to try to teach us how to do phone support. Seriously, we really did. The last question. Okay. I say, yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is for Microsoft. But it's a good question. When OS2 came out, you pushed it a lot, and you had a lot of developers check it out and everything, but you dropped it. If NT 
does the same thing that OS2 does for y'all and Chicago succeeds. Are you going to drop NT like a hot potato like you did OS2? The question was, will we drop NT? Uh, God, I hope not. Uh, the, the best way to answer that is that Microsoft is a market-driven company. Okay? No one bought OS2. And believe it or not, I was running a copy, you might have been running a copy, but for five years the product was on the market, I think it's like four years, we sold 300,000 copies. At that time, when we were negotiating with IBM, we were selling over a million units of Windows a month. Our customers demanded that we pursue Windows as a strategy. It wasn't up to, you know, we didn't think OS2 was a good product or a bad product. Our customers demanded that we do that. And that's what we will continue to do. We will follow our customers and we will be loyal to our customers. When you buy our products, you can ensure we'll be there for the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I'd like to thank both our guests. And I'd like to say I'm, I'm real disappointed in Microsoft marketing. They left uh, Doug here in a, in, a, in a real tough position, didn't, didn't really support him very well. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if Microsoft marketing is getting as bad as IBM <laughs> marketing. Uh, I very much appreciate both presentations. Uh, I think you've seen the future and you've seen the finest technologies the, this America has to offer the whole world.